Well, good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship. If you haven't been in a while, we're glad that you are here. If you're here for the first time, we are glad that you're here. I'll say a special word of welcome to the Bell Choir who drove all the way to a Bell Convention in Leesburg and returned safely. Um, yes, yeah, sure, we can clap for that. That's wonderful. A word of welcome to you who have come brokenhearted and heavy. A word of welcome to you who have come deeply needing the healing that comes from God. We are here to encounter God's holiness together. Amen? As a, we've got a, a couple of announcements to go through. I'm Emily, by the way. I'm the, the pastor here, and it's, it's an honor to be here. Um, we've got a couple of several announcements, exciting things happening this week. Today at 4.30 in the courtyard, the kind of the playground courtyard area back here, we are going to have a, a bonfire, less bonfire, more fire pits, um, but there will be s'mores, we will have um, the palm branches from last year's Palm Sunday, you know, when we waved them and shouted Hosanna, um, we'll be burning those and using those ashes for Ash Wednesday this week. Um, but yeah, the, the, the fire tonight at 4.30, it's intergenerational. The hope is to have kids that are two uh, running around with folks that are 92. The playground will be open for those that need it. Um, but and we'll have pancakes and um, I believe there's also, Bobby, where are you at? There's bacon and eggs and other delicious things happening as well. Um, so that, that is tonight. We also have coming up this Wednesday. This Wednesday begins the church's season of Lent. Um, and Lent, for those that are not familiar, it's the 40-day season that leads us into Easter, that leads us through the process of repentance, that leads us to life in Christ. Uh, it's a season of spiritual growth. And this year's theme for Lent it's based on a Luke 16 verse that said, if we are, where Christ says, if you're faithful in little things, you will also be found faithful in much. So the call, the invitation this season of Lent is to kind of look and see, all right, what's, what's a little thing? A little thing I can give up to Christ? A little thing that I can pick up? What's a, a little thing where I can invite the Holy Spirit to come and, and work on my life? And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, but we also have Friday, this coming up Friday, we've got our senior gathering. There'll be a luncheon at 11. The lunch is free, um, but they'll take up an offering to support one of the local food banks in the area as well. Um, coming up on Saturday, um, that's the 5th, we're also going to have a gathering for Margaret's Memories that'll be assembling bereavement boxes for families in the hospital that have lost loved ones and, and little ones who need them. So it's a, a sign of grace and ministry. Um, and then we also have a new member class that's coming up in the season of March. If you're interested in learning more about the church, if you've been a member for a really long time and just want to come and hear more about the Methodist Church or meet some folks that are new, um, please know that that's happening. And the hope, the plan, if you're interested in coming, there's, it'll be a three-part new member class. And then we're hoping to have folks join the church and take those membership vows on Palm Sunday, um, which is when we'll have the whole church gathered for one Sunday celebration together. Um, but we'll have more information about that. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, but for now, let's remember that all of these things are here to build a community. And so do me a favor and look around and greet one another. Just wave if you want to send a text message to somebody, especially if you're online. If you want to send a message or throw up an emoji, we are here to worship God as a community in Christ.
We are brought here today to glimpse the hope that Christ has for us. Open our hearts to receive that hope. We are brought here today so our fears may be healed and our lives transformed. Heal us, Lord Jesus, with your love and power. We are brought here to seek God's face and praise Christ who restores us. Let us be transformed into God's image from one degree of glory to another. Amen. Would you please join me in our affirmation of faith using the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is found in Exodus 34, 29 through 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face, But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, at this time we're going to invite our kids to come forward. If you are fifth grade or younger and want to come down for our kids' message, come on up. You did an excellent job lighting the candles this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Come on down. This is a very flowy dress, Diana. I love it. Thank you. And if you're if you're a kid and you're worshiping with us online, you are welcome to throw up your favorite emoji on the screen. We're glad that you're worshiping with us too. All right, how you doing this morning? Good. Good. All right, good. We are celebrating a special Sunday in church this morning. Wednesday is gonna be Ash Wednesday. Did y'all know that? Okay. This morning, do you know what today is in the church? It is Sunday. Yeah, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. All right, are you ready for this? I need you to repeat after me. 
transfiguration. All right, adults, all children of God, let's go transfiguration. transfiguration. Yeah. How many adults woke up this morning and went, yeah, Transfiguration Sunday. Can't wait to go to church. How many of you are like, I've never heard this before in my life? And all right. Okay, anybody, do you guys want to guess what the word transfigure means? Change. Change. Ding, 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 ding. That's, yeah, that's a pretty good, pretty good. What do you think, Diana? You want to throw anything else out there? Okay. So we just heard a Bible story from Exodus about how Moses went up and his face was transfigured or changed. His face got like suddenly very shiny and glowy. And so this morning, here's another story about Jesus. All right, so Jesus and his closest friends, Peter, James, and John, uh, he turned to his friends and Jesus said, come with me to the mountaintop to pray. And they climbed for hours until their legs ached and at last they were at the top and Jesus' face began shining with a light as bright as the sun and his clothes seemed to glow. Kind of sound like Moses, huh? So Moses and Elijah, two great leaders who had died long ago, suddenly appeared next to Jesus and began to talk with him. So what do you think Peter and his friends did? Whoa, Whoa. that's right. Peter and his friends were stunned. Lord, Peter gasped, we are blessed to be here. Let me build houses and we can stay in this wonderful place forever. But even as he was speaking, a bright cloud came down and covered them all, and a voice spoke from the cloud. All right, congregation, I need you to be the voice of the cloud. Repeat after me. This is my son who fills me with joy. I love him. Listen to what he says. So Peter, James, and John covered their faces. Y'all ready? Cover your faces and they threw themselves on the ground in fear. No, y'all aren't interested in that? Okay, we had, we had like, we had a little boy at the nine o'clock service who was like, bam, and we were like, all right, good job. Um, and so Jesus touched them on the shoulder and the cloud had gone and Jesus was alone with them. We cannot stay on this mountaintop, Jesus said. We must return to the valley where God's children need us. The end of the transfiguration story. What do you guys think that story means? Huh? It's right on the tip of your tongue? Well, I promise this is not a scenario where I have a perfect answer and I'm just waiting on the answer you should know. Because I gotta be honest, I think this is one of the weirdest stories in the Bible. I mean, I don't know, there's a lot of really strange stories. But this encounter where suddenly it's like, ha, ah, it's Jesus. And they're like, yeah. And then Jesus is like, nah, we can't just stay in this holy place. We got to go and ministry keeps going. And they just like walk down from the valley and then just continue doing ministry as if this like random glowy mountain story never quite happened. And the disciples still, even chapters later, were like, who is this guy we're hanging out with? And they're like, oh yeah, it's Jesus, son of God. Remember that? T- like, they still didn't fully get it. Um, so I think part of what the transfiguration story gives us is this hope that we're still in the process of recognizing who Jesus is. And God does give us moments where it makes sense, but also the fact that we're not always on that mountaintop means that sometimes we're still in that space of figuring it out. But there's hope, right? That we can encounter God and be changed too. So really, I just read that story this morning because I think for Transfiguration Sunday, it's helpful to have the Moses story and it's helpful to have the Jesus story. Um, That makes a lot more sense for the Corinthians passage we're going to read in a little bit. So, make sense? You're like, kind of yes, kind of no. Yeah. So if nothing else, I want you just to remember the word of God says, this is my son. Listen to him. That at least makes sense, right? Is there any particular way we can pray for you guys this week? Besides your beautiful flowy dress right here. Yeah. All right. Ready to pray? Ready. Repeat after me. Pray. Dear God, thank you for your Bible and your stories. Transfigure this world with your glory. Shine on us. Change our hearts that we may listen to you, come down from the mountain, and serve your people.
We love you, Jesus. Amen. All right, final thought. Are you ready? Have I shown you my favorite sign language word before? I've shown you? Which one is it? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Yeah, that's, yeah. But I have another one. Are you ready? Hold that one hand. Take your other hand. And you're going to, like, tap it lightly like this and then kind of sparkle off. Do you know what word that is? Glory. Isn't that pretty good? All right, we're going to come back to that. So hold on to that. So Jesus shows us glory. You ready? Okay. All right, y'all are welcome to go ahead and go back to your seats. Grab some coloring sheets and continue in worship.
Thank you. I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Bell Choir is one of my favorite examples of the church and God's kingdom where we each have different voices, different bells, different parts, and yet it is so powerful and beautiful when it comes together. Um, so indeed, thank you. Thank you, Bell Choir, for your hours of practice <laughs> that went into um, this moment of worship. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord God, we have come this morning and been reminded through the chimes of bells and the sound of harmony that you are a God who looks out for the sparrow and for the least and the lowly. And so we do pray in this world to have glimpses of hope and harmony. We pray that in this world that is broken and hurting, this world that is struggling with war and fighting, Lord, that as we come with heavy hearts, we do pray that again we would hear your promise that you do not leave us alone or forsaken. We pray this morning for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine and in Russia. We pray for those spaces that are at war in our own communities those spaces of, that are at war even in our own selves where our desire to do what is right battles with other frustrations or, or simply the, the desire to just sit and be still and submit to our own honest laziness, Lord God. And yet you continue to pour your grace into this world. We pray for healing. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for your spirit to come and redeem and make right. And Lord God, we pray for a church that is not silent. We pray that if there are places where we can speak hope and speak truth and speak life as an echo of your word, then Lord God, may it be so. We pray for spaces where we can speak courage and comfort to bodies that are at war with cancer. We pray that we can speak comfort and grace and community into bodies that are warring with loneliness and depression. Lord God, we pray to be the, the body, your body, here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, that we would be a church that is actively standing and working for your kingdom and your good and your transformation. Even if it's just in the smallness of our own lives, are the smallness of kindness to our neighbors and strangers. Lord, we pray for your grace to come upon us in real and concrete ways. Because, Lord, faith in theory is wondrous and also, Lord, we're called to repent of the ways that cause harm in the world. We're caused to, we are called to walk away from warring madness and walk in the way that leads to life abundant, and life eternal. So God, show us that way, that it wouldn't be just for us, but that it would be for the good of our community, that it would be food and shelter for those that need it, and it would be comfort for those who feel alone. Lord, we pray for your holiness to be lived in and seen and heard for good, for life, for your glory, O oh glorious Christ. May it be so. We give you our lives, we give you our struggles, we give you our hopes, we give you our church, our community, and even this world. Lord God, help us remember that even when we are bewildered or do not have the words, when the world becomes strange and our place feels tenuous, Lord, remind us that we do know to whom we pray. We pray to you, creator God, who wills good, for you, Redeemer God, who makes all things new. We pray to you, stirring spirit, healer of the nations. We ask for your guidance, and we pray for repentance for the ways that we've asked for the world on our terms, and instead ask that by your mercy, you may put the world and us in a new way, the way of Jesus Christ who gave himself us, the way of Jesus Christ who confounded authorities and lived in excellence and grace and that by your newness, by peace on your terms, and the newness and life which you promised, 
that we would again glimpse the glory of your Son, who is our Lord. All this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a, a moment of offering. And we do ask that you would give joyfully out of a heart of abundance, knowing that it's part of worship, that we put God first in our finances and first in everything. Um, and also knowing that the gifts we offer up become concrete missions and ministries. Um, so we've been asking through the month of February, what are some of your favorite missions and ministries in this congregation? Places where you've seen God live out and transform lives. So what are, what are some favorite ministries that you just want to name this morning? Margaret's Memories. Memories. Yeah. Concrete, just boxes that simply allow a family in the midst of grief and loss to hold on to memories and, and walk, with, um, walk with the kindness and grace of knowing that others have been with them too. Yeah, what else? Wednesday night dinners, absolutely. Again, folks can come hungry and we're going to be gracious in sharing what we have with those. Yeah, I think this past Wednesday we served 140 meals to the community. Yeah, what else? All right, we've been doing about three each morning. What's one more? The music ministry. Okay, choir, music ministry. Y'all should know, y'all have been named every single month. So yes, absolutely. It is a, a glory and a goodness to come and worship. So let us continue and worship God.
God of grace, to you we say alleluia. To you we worship and give glory. And we ask that you would take all of these gifts that are given, gifts given here in person, gifts given online, gifts sent throughout the week. We ask that you would receive them and transform them. Transform them into concrete gifts and signs of your glorious and heavenly kingdom, your life abundant and your hope for hope and life and transformation. In your name we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So indeed, we come with the transfiguration story before us this morning. Um, and we hold in one hand the story of Moses, who climbed up to Mount Sinai in order to receive the commandments from God. And in doing so, in drawing near to God, his own face was turned into this shining, shiny glory to the point where when he came down off the mountain, people were freaked out and didn't want to go near him. They were like, ah, I don't know about this like radioactive thing your face is doing. And so Moses had to like put a veil over his face just so he wouldn't scare other people. So we have the story of Moses who drew near to God and found his face transfigured. And then hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, we, and, and chapters and chapters of scripture later, we have a similar story where Jesus and the disciples, again, they are going up a mountain, depending on the this, this scholar. Some would even say it was possibly the same mountain, ooh. And Jesus and the disciples, they went up and again had this moment and this experience where Jesus himself, his face was shining and glorious. And so in both stories, we get this image where drawing near to God brings some transformation. Drawing near to God brings, brings us closer and deeper into this shining image of God's glory. And this is part of what Paul is calling the people to in the, the third chapter of 2 Corinthians. And so I invite you to hear now the word of the Lord. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. 
Not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as through reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. So therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So again, pastorally, just human confession, I don't always know what to do with the transfiguration story of Jesus and the disciples in that particular moment. That's not to say, I mean, that's not to say that it hasn't been a moment of inspiration. Um, that's not to say that, you know, scripture doesn't speak or, or that it's not one of the most pivotal stories. I, I just, again, when it's this moment where suddenly Jesus was shiny and then not, and they went down the mountain, again, I, I don't, that's just, I don't know, it's a hard story for me. And so some of this is just the honesty of saying, hey, when we read scripture, we wrestle with it. And that's okay. Because it's in wrestling, again, that's part of our biblical story, it's in wrestling that we draw near to God, we're willing to wrestle with it, we're willing to, to maybe even like walk away a little bit changed. And that transformation, that change, that, that willingness to come before God and then walk away differently, that to me is a huge heart of our gospel story. I mean, we see it so many points. I mean, even just in the word transfiguration, we get that image of transformation. We get, first of all, that hope that change or difference is even possible, which is something that we need. I mean, you look at the news reports, certainly this week, you know, I mean, I, I have to walk away from, from the news report thinking, gosh, this world is just broken, and I, I need that hope that it doesn't have to be this way forever. We have to hope in transformation. We have to hope that God's hope is for the world to be different. And if we're gonna lean into God's hope for the world to be different, then we have to be willing to be changed too. But that's, again, like that is the story of, of grace, amazing grace. You know, even in, in the hymn that we sing so often, you know, I once was lost, but now I'm, was blind, but now I, the very image, the story that we celebrate of resurrection is literally the story of death transformed and becoming life and resurrection and hope. Our story, the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ transforming lives is the story of somebody who has gone from addiction to, to celebrating newness and sharing that life with others. The gospel story is the story of, of a heart that is captivated and captured by fear and unforgiveness and grudges and then somehow in tasting the goodness of God has seen the possibility of forgiveness and opened to a heart that is no longer hardened but softened and graciously willing to love the neighbor who has previously wronged them. That is gospel goodness. That is transfiguration, I think, at its deepest and most touchable. The story of our story to say we are called to go from our lives of sin and death, from the lives of our selfishness and laziness. And y'all, I say that not to be like super judgmental. I say that simply to say as confessionally, humanity is lazy. I am lazy and selfish and left to my own stuff. Like, I'm not particularly good for others around me, and yet 
God calls us to a life that I, I do believe in a kingdom of God where we live for the sake of goodness for our neighbor and we live for the sake of welcoming all to the table and we live for this way of life that brings glory to God and allows just life and forgiveness and love to flow freely. I believe in that kingdom of God and I know we're not there yet. I know I'm not there yet. And so again, there's this hope and need for transformation. Now that sometimes, sometimes that transformation process is phrased as repent of your sins, recognize the space in your life that you are not living into God's glory and like turn away and come back. Sometimes that space of transformation is, is named as, hey, let's look at the spaces where we're not living into the fullness of God's abundant life. Let's look at the spaces of our life and our heart that are, are living into spaces that are not life-giving. Because if it's not life-giving, it's definitely not of God. God is life and life abundant. And sometimes I think what's even more dangerous than just the things that we're like doing wrong, because sometimes those are clear and easy to walk away from. You know, like, I have not murdered anybody today. Good for me. I think sometimes the harder piece is when we're living into spaces where we're just okay, right? Because if you're just like, eh, it's okay. It's not really bad, but like, it's also not life abundant. And it's in those spaces that I, like, we're just, you know, tired and apathetic and, and we're missing that life that God has, that transfiguration, that glory, that goodness. It's interesting, some scholars actually say that the, the veil that Moses wore um, wasn't even just for other people. It wasn't so that people wouldn't be scared. Some scholars will say, well, maybe Moses wore the veil because he was scared that other people would start to see his humanity again. When the glory of God faded from his face and he looked like a human again, Moses was, was worried to share that vulnerability with others. And so the veil wasn't even so much a covering up of God's glory, but it was a sign of the, the pride and his unwillingness to be like, yeah, we're on the same page right here. And so Paul calls us to this space of saying, hey, we are, we are called to live into the holiness of God. We are called to live into life abundant. We are called to live into the fullness of resurrection. And there are things, call it a veil, whatever metaphor you want to use, that get in the way. And so part of our call is to recognize those spaces, to name them, and let them go. Not because it's our own power, not because it's just on us, but because it is the work of the Holy Spirit says Paul. This is the work of God in us and through us, in our community and through us, in the world around us, is this transforming work. It's good. It's gracious. It's what God does in our lives. In my experience, though, I think, I think the, the reality, though, is I think we have this, like, intense vision of, like, yes, I'm a Christian. I'm going to live in holiness. But then, like, that transformation doesn't always stick, right? I mean, it's like having the goal of, like, I'm going to be healthy and eat healthy and I'm going to lose a bunch of weight. You don't just, like, get there by deciding that it's going to happen, right? In order to do that, in order to actually get to that space of transformation, it doesn't happen just immediately. Oftentimes, it really takes transforming work, right? And this is like, if there is a method to Methodism, the method is that we say, hey, God wants us to live lives of holiness, and sometimes we have to walk in that direction. Maybe for me, the moment of the transfiguration story I resonate with the most is that point where Jesus said, all right, guys, we have work to do. We have to go down from this space and continue the healing work of God. But that meant they had to hike down from that mountain. I don't know about you, I would much rather hike uphill than hike downhill. Downhill is hard on my knees. <laughs> Working, like hiking back down to get in that space where like, all right, I have the hope of transformation, but now I have to like actually go and do the work. God, that's not as fun as the transfiguration moment. I'd rather have the moment. But God walks us through the process. Literally, that's what we do in the season of Lent. It's 40 days that leads us from the ashes where we encounter our sin and we name those spaces. 
We literally have dust and ashes to say, hey, we are human and we are imperfect and we are frail. And that confession in some ways is, is honest. And then we walk the 40 days from the repentance of Ash Wednesday to the glory and resurrection of Easter. God does that in us, with us. And it does happen in small, honest, incremental ways. I was talking to, to somebody in the church just about um, you know, little changes and transformations, and we were talking, actually, again, back to that image of, of health and a diet. Um, and this is somebody that's looking to be in that healthy spot, looking to lose weight. And he said, here's the thing for me. If I just throw everything out and eat nothing, he said, I know that I'm never going to actually stick to that diet. So if what I actually want is transformation and change, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm making smaller shifts. Um, and one of, his, one of his examples that I love, he's like, look, instead of when I go to the grocery store and I buy potatoes, instead of buying like the really big potatoes, because you can get potatoes that are this big these days, he says, I just, he says, I'm just buying smaller potatoes. Because here's the reality of like, if what we're wanting is transformation in the glory of God, and if we really want to get there in authentic, actual ways over the next 40 days, it makes a lot more sense instead of saying, I'm going to change everything in my own intuition, but to say, here are faithful ways and things that I'm actually going to do slowly over time that will make a difference. This is where I love Paul's phrase. He says, we are being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We are being transformed into the glory of God. I mean, and doesn't that, not in like a self-righteous, ha-ha, look at me kind of way, but in like an authentic, like, God, I want to be shiny for you. Like, God, I, I want to live a life that is going to be like glorious and life-giving for you. And for Paul to say, we live into that from one degree of glory to another. Y'all, as Floridians, there's a really big difference between 92 degrees and then anything below 60. <laughs> anything below 60 is not Florida. I can't stand it. But you give me like 54 degrees or 53 degrees, I'm wearing a parka either way. Um, but in order to go from the horror of 53 degrees to the glory of, meh, my personal is probably about 82. I'm sure your ideal temperature is a little bit different. You got to go from one degree to the other. This is our process through which the Holy Spirit works on our lives is from one degree of glory to the next. You may not notice a big difference between reading scripture on Monday and reading scripture on Tuesday. But let me tell you, when scripture is on your heart every day for 80 years, there is glory in that. You may not know a really big difference between um, feeding somebody who is homeless, you know, one Wednesday. But let me tell you, when we are doing it weekly, the community starts to realize that we are a church that really does care for our community. And there is glory in that. This is a call, my brothers and sisters, from one degree of glory to another. This is the season of ashes, the season of Lent, the season of spiritual growth. And maybe there's a really big veil that needs to be removed from you. Or maybe it's just small degrees of changes in your daily living. But this is a call to live into the freedom of the Holy Spirit. A call to live lives of the glory of God. That we may be in this broken world a little bit more like the life of Christ. May it be so. Amen.
the God of abundant life and resurrection call you out of darkness and into light. May the God of abundant hope and transformation call you out of the old and into the possibility of the newness of the kingdom of God. May the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be in you, through you, and upon you, one degree of glory at a time. Amen.